Hello there, this is Dr. Mintz. This is a CT of the abdomen on a patient with left lower quadrant pain. It's been going on for several hours. Here are the coronal images. And I call your attention to the left lower quadrant. And now we'll shift to the axial images. Let you look it over, get an overview of what's going on here. Okay, so now here is the area of abnormality in the left lower quadrant right here. There are some calcifications which are calcified uterine fibroids. You see fibroid changes in the uterus. This is a big fibroid extending off anteriorly. So this is uterus here. Here's a fibroid here that's calcified. Here's a big outgrowth of the uterus which is a fibroid. But those are not the cause of the patient's pain what we see is in this left lower quadrant stranding. Stranding means little linear areas of opacity typically in the fat so if you look here you have nice pretty homogeneous dark fat here it's all lightened and there's a strandy stringy kind of linear pattern in this area and that's what's what we refer to as stranding Objectively, it is generalized increased attenuation of the tissues. In other words, there's a higher attenuation in these tissues here than there is in the normal fat there. Now take a look. This is interesting because this is an oval configuration of this process here, and there is some stranding around it, but most of the severe stranding seems to be right in this structure here and I point out to you that that structure seems to be directly abutting the colon so here's colon here here you can see if we go upward we're in the left colon right here so that it's, it's reasonable to have to try to, to have to trace the bowel to know for sure where you are sometimes so this is left colon left colon and then this is the beginning of sigmoid colon, so it's right adjacent to the sigmoid colon. So a very reasonable thought would be, is this sigmoid diverticulitis? Well, that certainly is a consideration. However, once again, notice that this is not soft tissue attenuation. It is a fatty structure with this inherent or this, this superimposed stranding, primarily in this lobular type of configuration mass here with more mild stranding adjacent to it and as I say we have uterine fibroid now I'm beginning to second think this in the left pelvis you know what that is that's a pelvic kidney so I thought it was a uterine fibroid but it is actually a pelvic kidney because there is no kidney on the left in the abdomen so that's what I get for having dived right into the right into the pelvis without close examination of the abdomen so what we have here then and I'll put this on the coronal images to give you a little bit better of an anatomic relationship here. What we have in the left lower quadrant then is this pedunculated kind of elongate structure with associated stranding and it's right next to colon and the colon is associated with some inflammatory edema in the wall of the colon there as well see if you follow it more distally you have a thin wall 
and if you follow it more proximally you have a thin wall so that segment of colon is inflamed now that might still make you think of diverticulitis but the primary inflammatory process or st area of stranding does not appear to be in the colon itself it seems that it's a it's arising from this area here so this appears to be an epiploic appendagitis that is the appendix epiploica that hangs off the bowel has gotten inflamed and what we have then is an inflamed epiploic appendage which is called epiploic appendagitis and on this coronal image you can also better appreciate that what is in the left pelvic area is an abnormally oriented and somewhat rotated kidney I presume and probably have some of the collecting system here calcification renal calcification that it's hard to identify the collecting system but this looks like this is a cyst associated with that kidney or maybe it's part of the collecting system very hard to tell because the anatomy of this left pelvic kidney is distorted because of its abnormal location so this is a case of epiploic appendagitis with an incidental finding of a pelvic kidney the right kidney looks normal and if we look at the lung bases you have right atrium right ventricle left atrium left ventricle here's the descending thoracic aorta which becomes the abdominal aorta when you get through the level of the diaphragm and these are the diaphragmatic crura they're called crura the, that's the plural of crus this is the left diaphragmatic crus this is the right diaphragmatic crus and these are the diaphragmatic crura we do see we do see an adrenal gland on the right we also see one on the left however we do not see a kidney there on the left whereas we do see a kidney on the right again that's because this is a developmental anomaly that just happens to be present in this case and that is a pelvic kidney here you can see the liver this is a cleft in the left lobe of the liver known as the falciform ligament that's where the falciform ligament lies rather and here we have rectum and we can follow bowel reasonably well here we have the sigmoid colon rather tortuous here we have the proximal sigmoid colon affected by that epiploic appendagitis we can follow the colon back another way to evaluate bowel is to start it proximally and follow it distally here's stomach that should empty into the duodenum first into the first portion of the duodenum the duodenal bulb and then the second portion of the duodenum so the bulb is right around here I'd say it's very small in this case then you have the second portion of the duodenum which is right next to the pancreatic head and then that turns this way as the third portion of the duodenum and then that courses superiorly as the short fourth portion of the duodenum which transitions at the ligament of trites into sm small bowel proximal small bowel and then you can follow small bowel loops distally and here you see very nicely the terminal ileum 
coming into the cecum, and this is a nice fatty ileocecal valve, so that confirms that this is indeed terminal ileum coming into the ileocecal valve and emptying contrast into the cecum, which then courses more superiorly into the right colon, and the right colon courses across the upper abdomen as the transverse colon and here we have the splenic flexure I'll go down a little bit here's the spleen here's some small bowel loops here but as you follow this and this up this and this this is colon so this is the splenic flexure of the colon hepatic flexure would be right here it's in this case it's immediately adjacent to the liver there's gallbladder looks pretty good I don't see any obvious stones but some stones are not visible in the gallbladder on CT renal stones typically are visible on CT gallstones not as much the abdominal aorta is normal in caliber. And if we go from above downward, the first vessel that comes off the abdominal aorta is the celiac artery. And below that is the superior mesenteric artery. And the superior mesenteric artery dives anteriorly first and then courses inferiorly. Here it is next to a portion of the pancreas. And it's in here right now. This is the, that superior mesenteric artery, but it's gotten smaller because it's given off some branches. So that's superior mesenteric artery. And what you see is these little dots are the branches of the superior mesenteric artery and superior mesenteric vein supplying blood to the bowel that is mesenteric bowel, small bowel. Sigmoid colon looks okay and so does the rectum with the exception of the area of sigmoid colon proximally which is adjacent to this epiploic appendagitis. Okay, that's it for now.